This video is brought to you by CoolStuffInc.com, where you can find cool stuff in stock. Hello, and welcome back to another day in the arena. It's me, it's CGB, coming at you with some different content this time. Rather than one deck, I'm going to try to introduce to you 50 Kaldheim deck brews in 50 minutes or less, which means I'm going to be moving along very fast. I'm going to try to keep the pace of my voice comfortable because I think keeping it absolutely psychotically fast would be bad. But uh, we're going to be talking fast and going over decks in very quick, rapid fire fashion, showing off the new cards in each archetype. Yes, there are a lot of Yorian lists. Yes, there is a Google Doc so that they are organized and you can look them up easily. And yes, you can check them all out on my Aether Hub profile. You can go there and hit the follow button and you can go into the Kaldheim Brews folder if you wish to. But for the most part, following my Aether Hub feed and using the Google Doc, which is linked below in this, the description, will help you follow along. So we don't have much time. Let's get right into it. The 50 different decks I have brewed with new Kaldheim cards for you guys just to get the brewer's delight going. Number one, Redain and Taxes. This is a mono white kind of annoying deck built around creatures that just have annoying effects when they stick to the battlefield. The Giant Killer Tap things, the Savior Sacks, you know these cards. The new cards in the deck primarily is Redain, God of the Worthy. Redain is an incredibly sweet card for two in a white flying vigilance. Snowlands enter tapped for the opponent and non-creature spells cost two more. We're not going to be able to introduce every card as we go through this quickly. Faceless Haven is another important card in the Snowlands because after you hinder your opponent's ability to play spells, cards like Faceless Haven can get in for big chunks of damage, and Maul of the Skyclaves makes your threats bigger and stronger. The next deck is Teamer Giants. This is the first giant tribal that I tried out. The new cards being introduced are Glimpse the Cosmos, Invasion of the Giants, and Quakebringer, Battle of Frost and Fire. And this is kind of a cool way to get some of the giant payoffs while still having a comfortable shell that you might be familiar with. With Edgewall Innkeeper, Lovestruck Beast, we still get to play the adventure theme, Beanstalk Giant being the green giant of choice. And we have Cyclone Summoner on the top end, which can enter the battlefield, take the opponent's entire board away, and the Great Henge to draw billions and billions of cards. The next deck, Jeskai Goldspan Runes. This is an interesting one, our first Yorian deck, and it will not be the last, I will promise you that. We are going to be using Runeforge Champions, which we can blink to fetch more and more runes from the deck. And they are going to pull out Rune of Speed, Rune of Flight, Rune of Sustenance. All of these can enchant any permanent and draw a card. We'll put them on a permanent that's safe, then we'll blink them with Yorian. We'll use that blink to make a bunch of Pegasus with Archon. We'll play Showdown of the Skulls to rebuild and have card draw. We'll play Saw It Coming to defend, and we'll play Goldspan Dragon because we can sack the treasure to enchant something like the Goldspan Dragon with a rune and make another treasure and another treasure. So, a pretty fun deck with a lot of new cards. Excited to see what a value pile this can turn out to be. The next deck is Boros Weapons. This has everything to do with equipment, everything to do with bashing the opponent's brains in with some sweet swords. So we have Reckless C Crew, which creates dwarves that immediately become equipped. We have Nahiri that makes core warriors that immediately become equipped. We have Halvar, the god of battle, which on the backside is an equipment, and this can move equipment back and forth every single combat. We have another Runeforged Champion deck, but this one only has two runes. Remember that Runeforged Champion can search the graveyard, so we can pull runes out of the graveyard to pass out haste and lifelink, and these can enchant equipments to give those abilities to the equipment. Call the Forge Master is another interesting new card for the archetype. Azorius Foretell Control. This is all the Foretell cards smashed in together with all the Foretell payoffs. Nico Defies Destiny and Cosmos Charger give you a kind of reward for playing Foretell cards. Vega the Watcher lets you draw a card whenever you play a Foretell card from your hand. Behold the Multiverse, Saw It Coming, Raven Form, all the goodies. Plus we have Fae of Wishes to get some additional answers. And when you play your Fae of Wishes from the Adventure Zone, that also draws a card with Vega the Watcher. 
and uh, the sideboard mainly just thrown together of various answer cards, definitely open to some development. The big ones, of course, that get foretold, Doomscar and Starnheim Unleashed. If this deck is actually good by just spamming foretold every single turn of the game, it's probably because the Wrath is really good in the format and the Starnheim Unleashed can take over a game. Azorius Spirits, this is blue, white, uh, just Spirit Tribal. I've got Bind the Monster as my removal spell of choice since these colors lack good, cheap removal cards and damaging yourself doesn't matter if you're beating your opponent to death first. The spiritual payoffs are the Clarion Spirit, which makes additional flying spirit tokens for the second spell, so you want a lot of cheap spells. And then we also have Skyclave Apparition. Shacklegeist lets you tap two untapped spirits to tap a creature you don't control locking down the opponent's threats, and rally the ranks, the new tribal enchantment, it can pump the squad. We also are a snow deck, so we can run Faceless Haven, which is also a spirit, because it's a changeling. Is it a changeling? Faceless Haven becomes a 4-3 creature with vigilance. I thought it was, I thought this had changeling. Maybe that's uh, the other version of the card. I don't have time to stop now. I'm gonna be really mad if it doesn't have changeling. Next deck, Jeskai Yorian. This is, well, you may have seen it coming. This has a few copies of Saw It Coming. We are also running Redain. It's a hard card to evaluate because I think it might be really important in mid-range. And this is a deck built to prey on other mid-range decks by just doing super powerful things. We have Showdown of the Scalds to blink, Doomscar to destroy all things, Battle of Frost and Fire as a blinkable sweeper. And we've got Nico Aris, the new Planeswalker, for the long, long, long games to grind it out. Mono White Life Gain. This one you know and love. It's become, according to MTGA Assistant, link in description, the most popular deck on ladder. And the new card that this deck gets is... Righteous Valkyrie. I think that the deck is going to gain enough life just by playing Righteous Valkyrie that we can use this to get to 27 and then have it be a pump for the whole team. I don't think we have to play a lot of other angels or clerics to make it good. I am... Can I, can I click on the Haven? No, I can't. I don't have time to check if it's Changeling. I thought for sure it was. There's going to be a million comments saying how it's Changeling. Demir Kazima Rogues. Yeah, look at that low curve. Must be Demir. Is it worth giving up Luris to get Kazima, God of the Voyage? Don't forget about the backside. The Omen Keel, that awesome vehicle that exiles three cards, contributes to the mill plan. We also have Saw It Coming as another additional card into the Rogue deck. But for the most part, this is the Luris version that you know and love. I wouldn't be mad at anybody if they cut a card or two and just added a Luris to the main deck because the endgame Luris lock with Robber is really good. But... Kazima coming back and drawing cards and drawing cards and drawing cards is a pretty sweet endgame as well and makes the endgame lock of Luris seem a lot less necessary. Oh, Kazima God of the Voyage and Agadim's Awakening is also pretty gross. Next up, we've got Kazima Control, a Go Big Demir deck using my favorite card in the whole set, Kazima, to draw a whole bunch of cards. It's really the only creature. We don't play it as the Omen Keel here. It's just the card advantage engine because everything else is designed to remove, counter, and kill. We have four Solemn Simulacrums. We have four, three Solemn Simulacrums, four Shark Typhoons, and some Ugins, two Ugins, to also take over the game, as well as one Crawling Barons. But this is a Yorian deck, Demir Yorian Control, and this is right up my alley. The next deck, Big Red Rakdos Ramp. Why would Big Red want to get into Rakdos? For Valky, God of Lies, which on the flip side is Tybalt, the Cosmic Imposter, a seven mana planeswalker that can certainly take over a game. So getting some black into the deck makes a lot of sense. We also get to run cards like Eliminate and Extinction Event that fill up some of the holes and the things that the red version had trouble dealing with. We don't have to play more expensive answers like Soul Scar anymore. We also have Goldspan Dragon to help out with the ramp, and we have the new Rakdos Pathway to help as well. This version isn't built around snow, although we'll get to a red deck later that is a big red deck built around snow. This one, just all about slamming Tybalt's and Valkyries, hitting the opponents with dragons. Good times. 
The next deck is Golgari, God of Death. This is a Graveyard Golgari Adventures list built around Egon, God of Death, which is a 6-6 Death Touch for 3, but you have to exile cards from your graveyard to keep it around. So, we focus on actually playing the 6-6 side, although of course you can play the 1-mana version that helps fill the graveyard first and enables itself. We have Binding of the Titans, which is a pretty underplayed card, but it does help fill the graveyard and helps you find your edge wall innkeepers and things like that. We also run Meyer Triton here in this version of the deck. The reason that we want to play Egon on three for the most part is that we're a great henge deck and we can resolve it early. The other new card that we have is Battle Mammoth and the mana is helped out by Dark Boar Pathway. The next deck is Rakdos Giants. Rakdos mid-range, but with a very giant theme, which I think makes a lot of sense because remember that Kroxa is an Elder Giant. Combine that with Bonecrusher Giant, combine that with Quakebringer, <clears throat> sorry, Quakebringer, we have a good number of Giants, and the giant payoff is Quakebringer itself, which deals two damage when it's in the graveyard. So when we're milling ourselves, turning over Quakebringers to get extra damage is a pretty sweet deal. We have four Egon God of Death to help with milling ourselves and unmilling ourselves. although for the most part, we're probably playing the artifact side. Valky God of Lies is our endgame with Tybalt. If our regular Kroxa and Quakebringer endgame doesn't work, this can go big and over the top of the opponent. I think that this deck has a lot of power, and to add to that power, we have Embercleave, which, when thrown on Egon God of Death, is, even if blocked, 13 to the face because the Death Touch double strike trample combo is really intense in the mana base we got the pathways and we've got an immersterum skull cairn because i think that this is one of the better lands and i think it fits this style this deck looks like a very persistent nightmare that can probably really tear up a few rogue decks the next deck is sultai snow control this runs a ton of new cards because it really preys on the snow theme Jorn God of Winter runs the whole thing, untapping all snow permanents, and on the backside being the staff that lets you get cards back from the graveyard, which is why you see a lot of interesting card choices. Ascendant Spirit is a good mana sink for all that mana produced by Jorn of Winter. Frost Augur is a good card to help you dig and get more and more lands, and some of the snow cards along the way. The next one, the next card that you will probably be surprised to see is the Priest of the Haunted Edge. This 4 can sacrifice to give creatures minus X minus X, or X is the number of snow lands they control. Combined with the backside of Jorn God of Winter, the staff, you can bring this back and then do it every single turn. Sculptor of Winter, untapped stuff, very nice. We also have Binding of the Old Gods to destroy permanents and ramp into more lands. We have Dar Draugr Necromancer, which is a card I didn't expect to use many places, but in combination with Jorn God of Winter, you can play the Necromancer, attack with Jorn, untap your lands, and use a card like Heartless Act or Eliminate, or you can, <clears throat> excuse me, activate Priest of the Haunted Edge to get the opponent's creature dead and possibly cast it the same turn. That's what a good boost of mana can do for you. Graven Lore is another way to use that mana to scry and gas back up by drawing a bunch of cards, and Blood on the Snow is a way to destroy all the creatures and all the Planeswalkers. This also gets things back when you spend the snow mana. So, the price is we have to play a ton of snow lands. Like, a ton of snow lands. And in order to do that, well, Ice Tunnel, Rhymewood Falls, Shimmer Drift Vale, we have to play a bunch of the common tapped ones, which isn't ideal, and it does make the mana particularly slow and clunk, which is why we use a curve that doesn't use a lot of threes and has 14 two drops, so that we're still taking action every turn. Berserker Tribal, welcome to Rakdos land. Rakdos Berserkers is a tribe that lacks a lot of the support to be an all-in aggro deck, so instead I'm trying to combine some sacrifice synergy as well as some treasure synergy and some boasting. I really do want to get off the boast of the Dragonkin Berserker, which is 5 mana to make a 5-5 five, five red dragon token with flying. And it also costs one less for each dragon I control. So when you combine that with Goldspan Dragon and the mana from the treasures, it's much more likely to pop off. It also reduces all boast abilities. So it makes the boast ability of the Dusk Wielder, which is lose a life a little cheaper, and Eradicator Valkyrie. 
it makes that boast ability a little bit cheaper. The best reason to be Berserkers is probably Blood Sky Massacre, but because it's so hard to curve out a good 1-drop Berserker, a good 2-drop Berserker, and so on, it's just part of the show, not the whole show, and it needed more support. I'm trying Bergy, the god of storytelling, to generate a bunch of mana to work with those boast abilities, the horn is good for card advantage, and more flying hasties like Rankle and the Goldspan Dragon. With Eradicator's Valkyrie's boast ability, you can turn cards like Duskwielder into card advantage in the late game, and it makes me wonder if I should try Claim the Firstborn or something like that in this deck, but Rakdos Sacrifice is definitely a different pile. I'm still running the Pathways uh, in the Snow decks, which is kind of interesting. Um, I'm not quite sure if I'm supposed to be doing that, but I think that the Pathways are so important to curving out that you have to. And the Snow card in this, in this deck is Frostbite, so we're not as dependent on having that much snow. Okay, I think I'm falling behind, so I gotta speed it up a little. This is Golgari Elves. Play a lot of cheap elves. A lot and a lot and a lot of cheap elves. Lots of cheap elves. Then, play Tyvar Kal or Herald Unites the Elves and make more elves happen, and get out Vorinclex and try to ultimate Tyvar, because the emblem with elves gaining haste and drawing two cards is what you really need to be doing. So, play elves, play Vorinclex, ultimate Tyvar. Try to do that every single game. Use Harald and Harald Unites the Elves to make it happen more often. And we are a snow deck. So, we've got a little bit of snow action from Sculptor of Winter. Big green snow aggro. This is more going for size over quantity and using Blessing of Frost with all of our snowlands to make sure that we draw a good number of cards in the mid game and gas up our threats to go over the top of the opponents. We also use Blizzard Brawl as a snow card and we use Vorinclex as well at the top of the curve along with the Great Henge to smash our opponents to bits and we have Faceless Haven. I'm still crowbarring in Castle Garenbrig because 5 mana Vorinclex sounds frickin' nice. Next up is Mono Blue Tempo. This deck is built around taking advantage of Ascendant Spirit and building it all the way up to its top abilities. However, there isn't much going on in Mono Blue, so we ended up also being a Kazima slash Omen Kill deck with cards like Baron and Brazen Borrower to keep the opponent off balance and try to set them up for rewind. Hopefully in the mid game, what we can do is cast multiple sleeps to keep tapping the opponent's stuff down while we play lands and bring back Kazima and gas up and draw into more sleeps, more bounce, more counters, keep the opponent from doing anything cool. And eventually while they're tapped down and after we rewind their good threat, we attack them with either the large Ascendant Spirit, the large Kazima, or Faceless Haven backed other stuff as well. I'm not so enthusiastic about the deck, but it looks like something I really want to try out and as my preview card, Bind the Monster, which is sweet. The next deck is Titan's Nest Demon. This is a Titan's Nest control deck, very similar to what I played before, with the key new addition being Burning Rune Demon. This lets you both fill your graveyard with one card and find a different card. Often you're going to play the Demon for two black by exiling your graveyard, and you're going to go search for Negate and Whirlwind Denial, and the opponent will pick one of those. You'll have a counter spell then in hand and a, and a something in the graveyard too to keep fueling the nest. Then hopefully you can play Shark Typhoon and just run away with the game. Shark Typhoon and Ashiok are the other cards that you can fetch if you want to, as fetching two threats might be very nice with your demon. We also got some mana support from the pathways. The next deck is Mono Green Elves. The big additions to Mono Green Elves, honestly, is kind of the snow build, because you run Blizzard Brawl and Blessing of Frost and Snakeskin Veil, and you run Sculptor of Winter, and you run Faceless Haven, so you make a whole bunch of mana and you get out the Vorinclex and you try to ultimate the Tyvar, but if that doesn't work, you can turn all of your small creatures into big threats using Blessing of Frost, and it also helps you draw a lot of cards. So this deck really does depend on Blessing of Frost and Vorinclex to carry the day. The next deck is Blue-White Trawler Control. This is a blue-white control deck built around the idea that I'm going to play a Dream Trawler and the next turn I'm going to bring back Kazima and draw a ton of cards and then smack the opponent with the Trawler. Pretty awesome, especially if you throw in a Seagate Restoration or a Teferi's Ageless Insight to draw double. It's definitely possible to 
in one turn just KO your opponent with a massive Dream Trawler attack. The rest of the deck is just built to make this happen. Solemn gets you up to the mana, Teferi Master of Time digs you through your deck, we know about ECD, this is the kind of thing you've seen me do plenty of times. It benefits a lot from having Hengegate Pathway, Doomscar, Saw It Coming, and Raven Form, a few other new cards added to the list. Another blue-white control-ish deck, this is Azorius Blink, and it's a Yorian deck. This one also runs Kazima. You'll see Kazima a lot, I promise that. But we also have four copies of Nico Aris, so the deck goes long by using all of its mana to draw a ton of cards whenever it stalls out. We have four copies of Glorious Protector in this deck, because we have multiple other creatures to blink. Glorious Protector can save Kazuma if the opponent tries to remove it. It can also exile a Charming Prince and a Skyclave Apparition, only to then create further loops with Yori, in the likes of which are absolutely disgusting. We also have Doomscar to completely protect ourselves from getting run over. We're at 20 minutes. How are we doing? I think we're doing actually really good. The uh, snap takes are going fast. I could probably afford to talk a little smoother. Let me know in the comments for sure what decks you are most excited about and what decks did I miss? What was I supposed to build in these 50 decks that I failed to build? Anyway, this is Green White Vorinclex Counters. Green White Vorinclex Counters is exactly what you would expect. A bunch of plus one plus one counter synergy and the new doubling season attached to a hasty boy in Vorinclex. The rest of the deck isn't even any new cards. It's actually all cards that already existed, but I think we all know that the plus one plus one counter deck needed a boost. I lied, I found a new card. I just added this one right before recording. Snakeskin Veil. Put a plus one plus one counter on target creature you control against Hexproof until end of turn. This helps save your largest creatures. It also adds plus one plus one counters, and it protects, obviously, the Vorinclex if necessary, but also the Conclave Mentor, which is known for dying hideous deaths far too early in the game. The next deck is Mono Red Snow. Oh, this is Mono Red. They play Mono Red. So, in this case, I adjusted the mana base to remove things like Castle Embereth that you all know and love and cut back on cards like Shatter Skull Smashing. And instead, we have four Faceless Havens, which I still think are a really good trade-off, although it is at a cost. And we have the Snow Mountains. This lets us run Frostbite. I wasn't nearly as high on Frostbite a few weeks ago until all the gods started showing up that are 3-3s. Three Thank Thankfully, Kazuma is not one of them. But Bergy God of Storytelling is a good example. Speaking of that god, there it is here in this deck, and the horn and the 3-3 three, three side designed to help take Mono Red a little further into the mid-range and get away from weak one-drop creatures like Fireblade Charger. Can Mono Red exist in a mid-range world? Does it get enough value? Can it play enough spells? Maybe? I'm not very... I'm not optimistic that this will turn out to be the right mono red build, but I think God of Storytelling is the best red card. One of the best red cards for sure. The other is Goldspan Dragon, but probably the best card for mono red aggro, along with F Faceless Haven. So I think we have to try a build with these cards. And we're also trying out Dragonkin Berserker. It's significantly better with Runerock Knight to help it attack into big things. And with Bergy, the boast ability can be used, and we can have an end game where we're spinning out 5-5 dragons. And that might be really good. So, this is my kind of, it's more of a mono red mid range deck, but since they're just not printing good red one drops, I think this might be where red has to go. The next deck is a Yorian deck. This is Bant Enigmatic Incarnation In Search of Greatness. So, In Search of Greatness really, like, you can come up with a lot of good ways to curve out with various creatures with it, but I think that the card is best used with permanents like enchantments that are very hard for the opponent to remove because you can use a Trail of Crumbs to play a free Omen of the Hunt. You can use an Eco Eris to play a free Enigmatic Incarnation. You can sack a Trail of Crumbs or the In Search of Greatness itself to search for a creature like another Skyclave Apparition. So the deck has a ton of lines. Like many other decks, it has Doomscar that it can foretell to keep the opponent from taking over the game. It has fetchables like Wicked Wolf, Thassa, 
Yorian Dream Trawler that you can just pull out of the deck for a lot of value. Archon of Sun's Grace is there as well. Satessan Champion is there as well. So it's a neat toolbox kind of approach to the typical Yorian Saga or Yorian Omen type of thing. And it also has food engines with Wicked Wolf, Trail of Crumbs, and Gilded Goose. I did think about having a Feasting Troll King as a six drop, but I don't think we're deep enough in the food world for that, but it would go nice with the Trail of Crumbs. So I'm really curious to see how these kind of awkward enchantments in search of greatness and enigm enigmatic incarnation end up working out together. Bant is also very much back on the menu now that the full menu of pathways is here. My next deck is five color shrine greatness. It's it's all the shrines, two copies of Calyx to keep drawing shines, four copies of Doom Scar instead of the other sweepers like Extinction Event, and four copies of In Search of Greatness to help you play your some shrines for free. You don't need a lot of mana boost to make this deck work. You just need a turn where basically you play one shrine for free and also wrath the board. If you can do those two things in one turn, this deck starts to pull ahead. The Kahira Companion is totally free. The Search of Greatness can still help you scry through your deck, even if it's not activating. So I'm optimistic that if you're going to play Shrines, maybe you'll enjoy playing it this way. We also have fours of all of the pathways that make green to give us double green on turn two. And we have uh, the Triomes that make green. So hopefully making green mana on turn two won't be too hard while all making the rest of the mana okay. There are no basic lands in the whole deck. Just Pathways and Triomes, baby. The next deck is Rakdos Sacrifice, and maybe you saw it coming. This does have some new, this does have some new cards, and it's a lot of four ofs as you can see, because I really like the synergy between these cards, and I want to make them happen as often as possible. We have Claim the Firstborn to steal the opponent's things, along with the Akron War to sacrifice their things. We have the standbys of Village Rights and Woe Strider, but we have the new one, Immerstrom Predator. Two and a black red for a 3-3 three, three flying. Whenever it becomes tapped, exile a card from the graveyard and put a counter on the predator. When you sacrifice another creature, the Immerstrom Predator gains indestructible until end of turn and you tap it. So a resilient sack outlet, which is very much something that we wanted to go with the steel yoink effects. Egon God of Death also makes the deck as a way to fill the graveyard or potentially just be a giant 6-6 six, six beatdown machine. And Croxa, Titan of Death's Hunger, is the backup plan. If the opponent's not playing a creature deck, bringing back Croxa over and over to just run them out of resources and beat them to death is the new plan. Orzhov, Yorian Angels. This is almost mono-white, with the only black cards being Kaya the Inexorable, Blood on the Snow, and Furja's Retribution. This is a Yorian deck designed... 100%. Oh, you know what? It just occurred to me. People have already typed 500 comments by now. Uh, it doesn't gain Changeling. Faceless Haven becomes a 4-3 creature with Vigilance and all creature types. It's like Changeling, but it's not Changeling. Because Changeling is a type, not an ability. I don't know. But anyway, it is all creature types. And in this deck, that's important. Because if you power up Faceless Haven in response to a Firja's Retribution trigger, it can gain the abilities from the Saga, such as tapping to destroy a creature, or Chapter 3, gaining double strike until end of turn. Very important. So the rest of the deck is all about getting that life total up and creating value. We have four copies of Righteous Valkyrie. We have Charming Prince and the Skyclave Cleric, which would gain two life and then three more if you have a Valkyrie on the field. Skyclave Apparition, it's a Yorian deck. Of course we're running that. Glorious Protector, a sweet way to exile and bring things back and gain all kinds of life with Righteous Valkyrie. Starnheim Unleashed, Legion Angel, of course, with some sideboard copies. Doomscar to keep the board clear. Elspeth Conquers Death, Kaya the Inexorable, and then Blood on the Snow, hopefully bringing back a Yorian and blinking some goodies or something like that. Uh, can also bring back a number of the other angels and types of cards, so... Uh, really actually enjoy this kind of deck. I love the idea of casting Amiria's Call with Righteous Valkyrie and gaining 8 life on the spot, which probably pumps the whole team 
and it's a snow deck, so we have to run Snowfield Sinkhole and Snow Covered Lands and Fabled Passage. I'm wondering if I can get by without the pathways. Most of my snow decks have also run the pathways. I wasn't sure that this deck needed to, but that's something to keep an eye on. You may have to run the pathways even in your snow decks. The next deck is Green Food Greatness, and we are 30 minutes in with 20 minutes to go to cover all these piles. It's gonna be an interesting race to the finish in search of greatness and food. That's pretty much it, so this is going to be a pretty quick deck tech. We don't have a use for the snow covered lands, so we have four Castle Garenbriggs and some Crawling Barons as something to put our mana into if we use In Search of Greatness but don't have a mana sink. In Search of Greatness is also great with the food because we can sack the food and use Trail of Crumbs to draw more cards after playing free spells off search. And to help us with our curve, we have four copies of Battle Mammoth. These can be a 4-drop if we foretell it, or it can be a 5-drop played off of a Wicked Wolf that curves us into a free 6-drop off In Search of Greatness from Feasting Troll King. The next is Gruel Greatness. As you see, just about any green deck, I decided it was worth trying to see if In Search of Greatness would work. In Gruel, though, it's particularly hard, because while we need enough permanence that we want to curve out with, we also don't want to draw multiples of In Search of Greatness, because if we do, we're just not putting enough pressure on the opponent. So I think two is the right number. You'll have them early in some games, but you don't need them in every game. So just an interesting spot to discuss when you need four copies of something, even if the deck is adjusted to take advantage of it. You don't always need four. Battle Mammoth makes it into this deck as well to fill curve and be another very large creature that serves as backup card advantage and works with the Great Henge. I am curious to see just how good Battle Mammoth turns out to be. The next deck is Naya Tokens. Naya primarily for three things. You want Forbidden Friendship, Showdown of the Scalds, and Luca, Copper Coat Outcast, which the only creature in the deck is three copies of Harmonious Archon, which can pump most of the tokens. Eska's Chariot makes two twos and is a really sweet vehicle that can also make copies of tokens. Battle for Bretagard on chat Bretagard Bret Bretagard on chapter three copies multiple artifact tokens on the battlefield. So if you have a birth, uh, a human soldier and dinosaur, which is different, uh, by the way, human soldier tokens are different from the 1-1 one, one human warrior that the battle makes. You can make multiple copies of them, which is cool. Showdown of the Scalds is great here to put counters on a number of our creatures, and Starnheim Unleashed is the foretold late game uh, kind of resiliency check. The deck could definitely run Transmogrify instead of Luka, but I like Luka for the ability to both minus and try to get two Archons, or to plus and try to threaten the minus seven to do damage to everything. I might change my mind on that, but right now I think we have enough fours and I really wanted uh, the Copper Coat Outcast instead. I feel bad for him. He got left behind when Agent and Fires both left the format. <clears throat> Do I have time for a drink? Maybe. Because <clears throat> this one is a doozy. Whew. All right. First of all, this deck has two copies of the World Tree. There. Are you happy? Are you hyped now? Kinnon Bonder Prodigy says, Whenever you tap a non-land permanent for mana, add one mana of the type that permanent produced. Works awesomely with Jaspera Sentinel. Works awesomely with Magda Brazen Outlaw. Yes, treasures. Treasures are non-land permanents that you tap for mana, so you double them with Kinnon. Also, the Sentinel can tap the Magda for mana to make another treasure. Kazima, God of the Voyage, keeps the cards coming. You may also play it as the Omen Keel in this deck, as you can crew it with the Magda, which is another sweet little synergy. Eska, the God of the Tree, lets all of our legendaries tap for one mana of any color. And on the other side is the Prismatic Bridge, which we might cast in this deck. Once you can tap Magda for mana herself, she makes a treasure as well. If you have Kinnon, Kinnon can tap for mana, but it's two mana. If you have Kinnon, Magda, and Eska, you tap for one, two, three, four, plus the treasure, five, six, seven, eight mana right there with those three cards. Throw in a Goldspan Dragon, where all of your treasures tap for two mana of any one color, and you get even more action. So we run 
four gold span dragons. We also have now the payoffs. Four Genesis Ultimatum to continue vomiting our creatures onto the battlefield. Watch out for legend rules. And three Terror of the Peaks. One Perforos, Bronze Blooded. One Clothis, God of Destiny. And of course that mana can activate, you guessed it, the World Tree. Why only two copies? I still need to curve out, and I still don't think 11 mana into the World Tree is what's going to decide most games. There's only two, a few gods here after all. You can go fetch a Kazuma, you can go fetch an Asuka, you can fetch a Clothis, and you can fetch a Perforos. I'm curious if you can fetch these and play the backside of them. I doubt it, but maybe. I think it says onto the battlefield. No time to read. But anyway, this is my attempt at Teamer Godlike Ramp, and it looks really fun. I'm not going to tell you it isn't. Look at the price tag. All those rares and mythics. Holy mackerel. Mono Black Snow Control. I'm excited about this one. Lots of removal spells, as you can see. Just the Wall of Nope. One Draugr Necromancer to steal the opponent's goodies. Then we have four copies of Tergrid, God of Fright, because we really want to play the Lantern side and try to drain the opponent with it and get them to sacrifice things. Then we play the Tergrid side and gain control of them. And we have four copies of Blood and Snow to blow up the opponent's stuff and return back either the Solemn, the Necromancer, the Tegrid over and over and make the opponent deal with it again and again. And on the very, very top end, we're also an Ugin deck. Because we're a snow deck, we only have one Castle Locked Wayne. I still run four Crawling Barons. Very worried about running out of win cons. Maybe that's unnecessary. The Crawling Barons might get to get cut. Four Faceless Havens, a ton of snow covered swamps. Next is Big Red Snow. Yep, another snow deck, but this one taking advantage of red cards instead of black ones. Four copies of Frostbite. Four copies of Tundra Fumeral to try to get that card to work out. Where do we put the colorless mana? Well, if we play this on turn four, we can put it into a Solemn Simulacrum. We can activate Maze Mind Tome. We can put counters on Crawling Barons or turn on Faceless Haven to attack with it. Little mana advantages here and there that hopefully will add up in the long game. Goldspan Dragon is here to help us ramp to Ugin, but so is Iron Craig Feet Ugin trick that we know and love. Four Crawling Barons and four Faceless Haven to make sure we always have an outlet for that extra mana. Next up, Mono Red Tempo. It's red aggro, but with a pair of a few twists. We do have a few copies of Magda Brazen Outlaw because mana is going to be important, because the extra mana we can use to cast Tybalt's Trickery countering that big wrath and hopefully letting the opponent reveal an unconsequential something maybe a birth of melitus <laughs> hit a free planes right uh tybalt's trickery is definitely the slot machine and i think that this adds kind of a chaotic nature to red that gets me even interested in playing it we are still a snow deck to take advantage of faceless haven and we have goldspan dragon because you can play dragon Attack with it, make a treasure, use the treasure to cast the trickery during the opponent's turn when they try to wrath the board or play Elspeth Conqueror's Death, and see if you can luck out. Once again, I don't like the one drops in red, so that is where we're definitely lacking. Without Fervent Champion, we don't even have one. But I think the deck is cool, and I'm excited to play this, even though it is, in fact, mono red. Next up is... Dwarves and Dragons, aka D&D, &D, a Boros deck built around the Dwarf Tribal in Magda's ability to sack five treasures, search your library for a dragon, and put that onto the battlefield. I wanted ways to protect my lovely Magda and my dragons, so it has four copies of Selfless Savior. It has two copies of Staunch Shieldmate, which is a dwarf, a 1-3. Pretty, pretty lame dwarf, but we do what we can here. And then we have four copies of Feet of Resistance. So when the Goldspan Dragon is targeted and we make that treasure, we can use this to give the Goldspan Dragon protection from a color and a plus one, plus one counter. It's like the Snakeskin Veil. It's like Negate. It's like the Tybalt's Trickery in the last deck. It's just using Feet of Resistance to defend our dragon. Then we have Magda, which of course is our engine trying to make treasures by attacking and tapping dwarves. We've got four copies of Rimrock Knight, which can also target the Goldspan Dragon to create a sort of ramp effect. We have two runes, the Rune of Speed and the Rune of Sustenance. Never forget that your Runeforged Champion can fetch the Graveyard as well. Then we have two Gadrock the Crown Scourge, which says that the 
you get to make a treasure when creatures die. That's interesting. Maul of the Skyclaves, because I think the best way to get Magda to actually trigger without dying is to throw the Sky Maul onto her. So it's interesting. We also have two Terror of the Peaks that we might be able to fetch up with Magda, and then creatures we play will trigger the Terror. So uh, still a snow deck, but running pathways and having a couple of Faceless Havens, which, because they're all creature types, can trigger Magda when it becomes tapped for mana, which is kind of an interesting, weird little synergy. Next up is Mono Red Giants. The giant aspect of this goes to four copies of Bone Crusher Giant, four copies of Calamity Bearer, which says if a giant source you control would deal damage, it deals double, and four copies of Quake Bringer, which we've already met in the past. I think these are the interesting giants, and then what we're trying to do is find all kinds of ways to just deal a ton of damage to the opponent's various things, because we're also a Taralf God of Fury deck with three copies. And that says whenever excess damage is dealt, we can redirect it. So with Taralf God of Fury and a card like Squash, if we squash a 2-2, we still have four damage to point to face or another target or whatever. And with Calamity Bearer, making giant sources deal double, it gets even more intense. So this is a, a go big deal, lots of damage. That's why we have Demon Bolt for one red after a foretell. This is four damage to a creature or planeswalker. But with Taralf, we can spread that damage around at a very low cost. And we have Bergy, because I still think Bergy is very important for making extra mana and playing a lot of cards. And I think Bergy's Horn is important for playing long games of magic. Plus this kind of uh, commander deck intro card here, Fire Giant's Fury, you have to craft this. You can't get it out of packs. If we get this off on, say, a Calamity Bearer, an attack, then it, it's insane. Like, we exile 10 cards that we get to play next turn. Absolutely epic. It's a snow, it's a snow deck. It has Faceless Havens. All right, we're under 20 minutes to go in the video, but we're definitely on time. I'm a, Apparently, I can do quick intros. For those of you who think my intros take too long, look at me. I'm just sitting here flexing minutes, basking in my own awesomeness. Let's dive into Bergy, the song combo. Yeah, if you have this card that creates one free red mana every time you cast any spell, and you have a bunch of spells that only cost one red mana, imagine the cards you'll draw if you play a song of creation. The mana is definitely the tricky part. So we have all of the pathways, of course, that are on brand, but I didn't want to play tap lands. So I have one forest, one island each, and two fabled passage as well. It's gonna be iffy if we can get the Song of Creation cast, but one cool trick is to attack with your wayward to, uh, let's see, does it work that way? No, actually that's not gonna work, is it? Never mind. I was gonna say attack with your wayward guideways beast to pick up your bark channel pathway. But that does work if, say, you set this down on blue and then you draw the island, right? You can pick this up and then set it on green and have mana for Song of Creation. So, uh, is this deck good? I have this weird idea in my head that we play a Bergy, then we play a Song, then we use the extra land drop from Song to play a one drop, and it makes a mana. And then from there we cast like six to ten one drops in one turn, and we attack with all the haste ones, Fervent Champion and Wayward Guide Beast. We go face with the burn, we use the pump spells, we deal a billion damage, and we ride off into the sunset. I think this deck could be absolutely wild. It's, it's going to be fun. At worst case scenario, it will be fun. Valky Grixis Control, were you waiting for something evil? I've got a deck for you. Oh man, actually, I'm under six minutes. I gotta talk faster. Anyway, Valky. Kazuma for card advantage, saw it coming for counters, Battle of Frost and Fire for a sweeper and awesome scry and more value on top of it, and of course the great and powerful Shark Typhoon for the Grixis Mages. Esper Terrigrid Doom. This is a Doom for Told deck that uses Terrigrid God of Fright also to steal all the opponent's goodies. Skull Raid is a foretell card you can play on the cheap after getting a Terrigrid out to steal whatever permanency opponent discards. A cool thing about Treacherous Blessing is you can target yourself with Terrigrid's Lantern and sacrifice the Blessing. That is a pretty cool little 
sneak attack trick. This is a Fae of Wishes deck. It has a wish board. Enjoy. Next up is Demir Blood and Snow combo, built around the combo of Shipwreck Dowser, which enters the battlefield and returns an instant or sorcery to hand, and Blood and Snow, which returns a creature to the battlefield. If you have these two cards going, every single turn you can wrath the board with Blood and Snow. To win the game, we're a mill deck with Teferi's Tutelage and Didn't Say Please, which lets us play cards like Into the Story and Drown in the Lock. The next deck is Bant Orvar Fight Club, and this is built around Orvar the All Form. This is a changeling. Whenever it's the target of a spell or ability, it co can copy, or no, whenever another permanent is the target of a spell or ability, you can copy that permanent. So we can make multiple Llanowar Visionaries, Skyclave Apparitions, Battle Mammoths, Elder Gargross, Dream Trawlers, when we use them to fight things with Ram Through and Primal Might. This deck is not fast. It is very slow, but it might be very fun. Five, under five minutes. The next deck is Mystic Yorian Reflection, trying to set up the combination of Mystic Reflection and Omen of the Sun, making multiple copies of our own cards, such as Archon of Sun's Grace, Skyclave Apparition, or Dream Trawler, or Yorian, although you can't target the Yorian, so never mind. But you get what I'm saying. We basically want to make a million Pegasi with the Archons or create multiple Dream Trawlers and totally spank the opponent in that manner. This is the idea of setting up a deck around Mystic Reflection instead of cramming it into everything else. Grixis Reanimator. This is Valky, the God of Lies, and Carter's Vicious Return, and a whole bunch of other legendary stuff, including Quakebringer, which is great in the graveyard. Blood and Snow also brings things out of the graveyard. It uses a whole bunch of new cards. It's very, very expensive. It fills the yard and then brings all kinds of big monsters back. And it's a snow deck, so it runs the weird lands. You're gonna love it. Kazuma Saltai Ramp. Basically, it's the Saltai Ramp decks that I love to play with Binding of the Old Gods and Kasuma of the Voyage, so that we're always drawing a ton of cards. I'll run Blink. And this is a Azorius Blink deck using all the Thassa, Glorious Protector, Charming Prince, Flicker of Fate shenanigans, but to try to flicker all run and have it uh, be the backside, the five drop, for much less mana. And we're using Alseed of Life's Bounty to hopefully protect that investment since it's just kind of okay. Azorius Flash, a blue-white sort of control deck with Rewind and Ascendant Spirit to try to pump it up as well as Graven Lore. Basically using all the cards that you can play at instant speed and play an awkward tempo game, right down to the Shark Typhoons and Voracious Great Sharks. It's a snow deck. Boros Warriors, two decks to go, and we've got just a couple of minutes left on the clock. Fireblade Charger, Usher of the Fallen, Karagan, Intimidator, Rally of the Ranks, Naming Warrior, and four copies of Hakdos and four copies of Winota, because I always want to hit the Hakdos. Trying to take advantage of Resplendent Marshal, which is great because you can discard a creature with Seasoned Hollow Blade. And we have Showdown of the Scalds to refill if bad things happen. Final deck. Is it the final deck? Yes, it is. It's Is It Giants. We are right there on the doorstep. Four Frostbites, two Fire Giants Fury, four Glimpse of the Cosmos, four Invasion of the Giants, ton of giant payoff. Orvar the All Form, which has Changeling and is therefore a giant. Faceless Haven, which can be a giant. Three copies of Cyclone Summoner we're trying to ramp into using Invasion of the Giants. Three Tectonic Giants to make sure we always have that going on. We also have four, three copies of the Battle of Frost and Fire as the one-sided awesome non-giant sweeper. And of course, the great and powerful Quakebringer. That it's a snow deck, so we have to run Volatile, Fjord, and other lands that aren't snow lands had to be ignored for the building of this deck. Ladies and gentlemen, that brings us to the end. 50 Kaldheim decks in under 50 minutes with about a minute to spare. So if you make sure that you check out the Aether Hub, you can go through all these decks at a slightly slower speed, download the list, Leave comments, let me know what you think of them. There's also a Google Doc, link in description, so you can go through and see the colors and click on them in a more easy to organize way, however you want to do it. Did you enjoy the 50 decks for Kaldheim? Did this get your Brewer Spark ignited? I certainly hope so. Uh, that is, is, in fact, what it was intended to do. Not break the format necessarily, but also, of course, as a, a pure alpha content creator play, now, every time you see any of these 50 decks anywhere else on the internet, you can say, CGB did it first. Don't, don't leave that on their videos. That's rude. But 
you know. I know, you know. And you kids who stayed till the end, of course, you're cool. Thank you for watching this video. As always, I will see you in the next video in the realm of Kaldheim. Remember, stay cool.